Yeah. Is it corner driving? No. <laughs> Not yet. No. 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 Maybe in the summer we'll practice. I think sometimes it's okay to wait a little bit longer, yeah. right? Yeah. Until summer and it's just... Well, good morning to everybody. We are so glad you're here on this continuing celebration of the season after Epiphany. Again, the season where we get these glimpses into who Jesus is. Just uh, uh, a few of those glimpses of what he has come to do and why he loves us so much. And how fantastic is that? A few announcements. Please make sure you notice them in your bulletin. Uh, again, uh, about Sunday school and, of course, Ash Wednesday service. That's hard to believe that's coming up. But that is coming up soon, fast and furious, so please take a look at that. Youth lock-in, we've rescheduled that for February the 24th, and that will be at St. John's. Our basement is still not in any condition yet to host a lock-in. That's uh, our, our James, our, our 
Our guy is uh, working on that right now. Fast and Furious, hopefully it will be done soon. We also actually, believe it or not, have a date now for our work camp in the summer. That will be June 25th. We are going to be doing that with Hebron in Kentucky. They're coming back up here, our kids. But we also have two other congregations. Obviously, we've been working with St. John's. But there is a new church in Lebanon, Ohio, a United Methodist Church. And they are going to bring some kids up, too, for our, our camp. So we're going to be packed. It's going to be a great event. And we have a lot of planning to get done for that. So please keep your eyes and ears open for that, for planning sessions. If you'd like to help out in any way. It uh, doesn't mean you have to be there with the kids. It doesn't mean you have to sleep with the kids. It could just mean that you come and help me buy some groceries. That would be fantastic, too. Okay, you will notice, many of you, that we are still lacking offering boxes. That is not an oversight on our part. Uh, we ordered those back in May or June, and they are still not here. Uh, we've called the box company that produces those, and they said, yeah, we know, we're kind of behind schedule. We can't get supplies in fast enough. So they're printing them and sending them out when they get them. And so hopefully, if they get here like June, they'll give us a discount. Who knows? But until then, if you really would like to uh, put, um, you know, put them in an envelope in some way, there are plenty of envelopes around here. Just put your name on it. Uh, and we will make sure our our, uh, our recording secretary, I should say, will make sure that uh, you get credit for that. Now, I know a lot of folks don't care about tax purposes or anything of the sort for those, but I always use my offering boxes for one person. It holds me accountable because I certainly have an amount that I would like to give. I feel God has called me to give, and that, that holds me accountable to that. And uh, But otherwise, you don't have to use envelopes at all if you don't like to. So. Nobody else is looking at it except for Candy. She only sees the number and puts it with the name, and nobody else is looking at that. That's your personal business between you and God. So we just want to make sure that's clear with that. I'm not looking at it, and nobody else is. Okay, um, we did have one other announcement, personal concern brought up to us beforehand, and uh, that was to pray for uh, family friend Lexi, uh, young lady who had a heart attack, and. Uh, and we just want to pray for her and her friends of the Turner family. We'll certainly keep her in prayer sitting too. Any other people concerned or announcements today? All right. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. We invite you to stand and make confession before the Lord. We begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your water and the Holy Spirit, God gives to us new life. Let us confess together our sin that we may be renewed in the covenant of holy baptism.
Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. I am uh, the one who did the bulletin today because our person who does the bulletin is not doing well. She's probably watching Paula. Welcome. But uh, so obviously all of your bulletin for today is the hymn of praise. I would we would like to do that. That's so I invite you again to open your hymn books. So that we might do a setting ten to hymn of praise. And that is found on page 203. God. 
It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. So consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were noble by birth. God chose what is foolish in the world's eyes to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Things that are not to reduce to nothing things that are. So that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ. who became for us wisdom from God. Righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Here is the lesson. Let us read responsibly the 15th Psalm. Congregation reading the indented portion. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle? Who may abide upon your holy hill? Those who lead blameless life and do what is right, they speak the truth from their heart. They do not slander with the tongue, they do no evil to their friends, and do not cast discredit upon our neighbor. In their sight, the wicked are rejected, but they honor those who fear the Lord. They sort of honor God and do not take back the words. They do not give their money in hope of gain, nor do they take bribes against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be overthrown. Again, hand out, posted for those online, on the Facebook announcement for today, for those present with us. I got it in the bulletin today. Yes, that deserves a pat on the back. You're welcome. But you know what you can do with these? Pitch them. Don't care. If you'd like to use them, fantastic. If they're helpful to you. Today, uh, today is a, I love this lesson. Most of us do that Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached, proclaimed. It is more than the Beatitudes, by the way. The Beatitudes as we call them, are just the beginning. But they let us know that there is something completely different about Jesus. 
It's about what he's come to bring. In fact, I would tell you that oftentimes in our Lutheran church, we like to use the phrase that the church is countercultural. That is not true. The church is not countercultural. And I'll tell you why, because the, that is the wrong frame of reference when you refer to our behavior and how we're supposed to live as, a, as counter to the world's values. We live in a transcendent fashion that transcends the values of this world in a way that nobody in any way in their right mind would ever think of as the right way to live. Because how do we live in our world today? Well, let's see. The rich and the powerful tell everybody else what to do, where to go, how high to jump, and where to get off. That is not the values of the kingdom of heaven. In the values of the kingdom of heaven, the rich have no place unless they come to repentance and recognize that their power, their wealth, and their riches are not to be used for their own benefit, but for the benefit of those who are weak and powerless. Because God has a heart for those that everybody else dismisses, and if you are one of those that you feel like you've been dismissed by the world, well, you are in good stead. Because you're exactly the type of person that God wants in his kingdom. The God of the universe stooped down the earth to reach the poor, the helpless, people like you and me, people who are completely broken and have nothing to our names, and we just throw ourselves in the mercy of God. So listen to what Jesus said. Did you hear that? He went up to a mountain with his disciples. Our lesson said for today, he sat down. That, by the way, is really important. The Roman Catholic Church kind of has an idea of this when they talk about the Pope speaking ex cathedra. Have you heard that phrase? And what do they mean by that? When the Pope sits down and makes this particular pronouncement, it is as though God is making that pronouncement. Well, in this case, Jesus is sitting down as an indication of his authority. That he's speaking on behalf of God. You better listen. See, in our culture, I'm standing up. Well, honestly, because I never know whether I'm really speaking in God's authority. I do the best that I can. And you should take my words and evaluate them. Because I can guarantee you, I make a whole lot of mistakes. All right? So you should always take and evaluate everything I say. And evaluate it based on what the scripture says. I can be wrong. Jesus is sitting down. He has authority. You better believe that what Jesus is saying speaks for God and on behalf of God. So he sits down. He's sitting as a sign of authority. He opens up his mouth. Now, I love this phrase. You know, we don't capture this um, well in our English translations. Uh, he began pouring out his heart. That would be a better translation of that. He began pouring out his heart to us. In other words, it's a process that has no end. Jesus just started pouring out his heart for us. Jesus hasn't stopped pouring it out his heart for us ever since that sermon on the mount. He's still pouring it out for us. And then what did he do? He began to teach them. Again, ongoing concept. He did, this isn't just once and done. This is a continuous lesson for us that we are meant to feast upon. He opens it up to us. It's an ongoing teaching. And he begins with the most profound thing ever. Oh, the blessedness of the poor in spirit. Now, in Luke, Luke says, blessed are the poor. Why is there a conflict between Luke and, and, and Matthew? Did one miss here? My gut reaction is that Jesus said, blessed are the poor. But Matthew heard, blessed are the poor in spirit. Which one's right and which one's wrong? Which one's right? Yes. They're both right. Because you know, sometimes somebody says something and it can have multiple applications. This is something I didn't realize. I just learned this about two weeks ago. One of the books I was reading. I didn't realize that in Jesus' day, somebody was a follower of a rabbi. They actually brought with them notebooks. It was common for followers of a rabbi to have a notebook in which they would take their notes. 
It is very likely that the disciples sat here and Matthew was sitting here saying, oh, I'm going to write this down. Where did we get the Gospels from? Probably from these notes that the disciples wrote down while they sat there and listened to Jesus. And so one of them, so Matthew's sitting here and said, Jesus said, blessed are the poor. Well, you know that? He probably also means by those of us who are broken in spirit because I'm a broken man in spirit. I'm sure that applies to me too. And he wrote that in his notes and margins there. And he wanted to make sure that you understand that this was part of the implication of what Jesus is saying. Because we may not be physically poor, but we come to God with absolutely nothing. And this is what Matthew is trying to convey to us what Jesus was saying. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? It means a person who is weaned from self-sufficiency. You've gotten over the fact that you can do it all by yourself. Because you can't. Neither can I. What does it mean to be, blessed, to be poor in spirit? It means that we point to nobody else but Jesus Christ. We are Christ bearer. We're no longer advocating for, Dave Jones, and look how great I am. We're saying, you know what? I'm pointing to Christ. I'm going to carry him instead of the banner for me. I'm ever complaining about my spiritual lack. I just need to continue growing in my faith, my relationship with God, rather than pointing to everybody else's spiritual lack. You can tell very quickly a person who's poor in spirit because a person who's not poor in spirit, who is arrogant, who is always pointing their finger about how everybody else has got to get their act together, doesn't understand the depth and the love of God that God has for them and is truly not understanding what it means to be poor in spirit. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? It is someone who begs for mercy. They know they don't deserve it. Again, it wouldn't be mercy if you deserved it. You know that you've got no reason to come before the throne of God and expect anything but judgment. You throw yourself at God's mercy. And then you ultimately take Christ on Christ's turn. You don't negotiate with Christ. Well, you know, that's really good, but how about we add this to the contract? It's not the way you come to Christ. You take Christ as he is and everything he has to give to you. And you ultimately exalt because at the end of the day, when you throw yourself at mercy, guess what you get from Christ? Mercy. You get the kingdom of heaven because Jesus loves those who are poor, who come to him broken and throw themselves at his mercy and guess what he does with you? He makes you an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven. You, the poor, the broken, the downcast, become the wealthiest people in the universe. Well, maybe not materialistically. But you are an inheritor of God's kingdom and his child. I've told this story about uh, how we had a woman years and years and years ago, 20 years ago, Janice, who she had some significant physical difficulties. And we as a church really kind of adopted her and took care of her. And um, she had been in a car accident and broken her back. And a uh, very brilliant woman. She had been a scientist and she just wasn't able to take care of herself. And so we would take her food and take her, you know, provision. And people would come and maybe clean her bathroom and do things that she just wasn't able to do. And I remember one day, we just had an overflowing amount of food to, to set her up for a time. And we brought this, it, two carloads full of food and some supplies and cleaning supplies and kids who came down to clean her house and she said, no, no, you can't do this, you can't do this. What do you mean we can't do this? You guys cannot do it, I'm not going to accept this. I said, why, do you, why can't you accept this? She said, because I, I, I just, I, mean, I, gotta, I can't pay you guys for this in any way. And I just stopped right there and I looked and said, Janice, Look at me and hear what I'm going to say. If you can't accept this little offering from our church, how are you going to accept the grace of God? Because you can't pay God back for that. And she just, well, okay. <laughs> I don't remember what she said. All I can say is that I'm bigger than her. She was a little tiny bit of nothing. We brought all the food in again. How are you going to receive the kingdom of heaven if you're too proud on this side of the kingdom to depend upon God's grace and mercy? 
What Jesus does is he turns that entire, this is why I say Jesus isn't just countercultural. He turns the whole values of this world on its edge, the natural law on its edge. Natural law says that it's the survival of the fittest, the strongest. But in Jesus' case, he says it's the survival of the kingdom of heaven of the poorest. The weak are the ones that win the day because they depend upon the true victor, Jesus Christ. The race goes to the slow person who might not even be able to cross the line by themselves because they don't have the strength or the energy to run the race. I bring them over the finish line, Jesus says. God helps those who cannot help themselves. Remember that stupid commercial in the 70s for those my age and older uh, that was put up by the Mormon church that were they it all with God helps those who help themselves. That is not in the Bible. That's Benjamin Franklin. Sorry, but Benjamin does not speak for God. The Bible says just the opposite. God helps those who cannot help themselves. It is of those that the kingdom of heaven is made up of. I know, I, I kind of hate these things. There's only three types of people in the world. Well, this, this is silly. But three types of people. Those who fall short and know it. Those who fall short and know it, but still try to find a way to earn God's pleasure. Those who fall short and know it. Oh, I'm sorry. The first one is those who fall short. Don't know. Pardon me. Those who fall short know it. They know they have no hope of earning God's pleasure, so they throw themselves at God's mercy. Who does Jesus say are of the kingdom of heaven? That last group. Blessed is the person who is impoverished spiritually, who can never, ever, ever repay his or her debt to God, therefore depends upon Christ's charity for salvation. You're a good step today. We throw ourselves to God's mercy, and God makes us inheritors of the kingdom of heaven. Let us give thanks and pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful again for this good news today. Because honestly, there are days I feel really weary, and I can't even stand myself. I'm sure everybody here feels that same way at times. We realize that we've run out of our bag of tricks and we fall short in so many different ways. But man, that's not what it's about. It's about the gift of Christ. You just love us. So we just come to you and admit that, God. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get to heaven by being a good person. So I throw myself in your mercy today and trust you will take us broken, contrite, and lift us back up and accept us as your children this day. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of the day is Love Divine. All love is excelling.
God has made us his people for our baptism into Jesus Christ. Living together in trust and hope and faith, we confess together our faith. I believe in God, our Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died in his spirit. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last saints. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you with our hearts filled with concern for those that we love. We do see a broken and sinful world of which we are participants. We can't just point our fingers at others and claim it's all them. But we do see the violence in Ukraine today. We are so distraught that we are still here praying for your protection, your people, your love. But we also know you don't love the Russian people and just pray that you would find a way for peace to be restored for people's lives to be restored. We also lift up this day uh, our leaders in our country. We again continue to struggle with uh, violence. We've seen the, 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 the murders over the course of these last weeks have just been tragic and, and, and so sad. Uh, the violence that exists even by some of our public officials. <clears throat> these things break our heart because we are called to care and love each other. And so we pray for those who are touched by violence in our country. We pray that you would bring peace to their families, even despite the chaos of life. Let them know that you have not abandoned them. And pray that you would help us to do better in how we respond to each other. We use our words and not our fists. We use kindness and love and not hate. We also lift up this day those who are sick and shut in, those who are physically struggling for care, for Lexi, the young woman for whom it was mentioned in her announcements today. Be with her. We know she's still in a time of crisis in the hospital. We ask that you would bless her doctors and those who work with her nurses and deliver her to safety and health. For Noah and Morocco and Tina, for Jackie and Ari and Carissa, for Jeff and Judy and Joanna. Mrs. Byers and Cheryl, Jim and Mikey, those with cancer, John and Bob, for Mike and Pam and Joseph, Sam and Mikey. May you continue to surround them with your love and their time and need and bring them to health, bring them to peace. But we also pray for their families, for it is good of us to be concerned for those struggling with cancer, but their families are going through this battle as well, too. So we pray that you would be with that and give them strength. For those who mourn, especially, well, I apologize, this was in from last year, you can tell I did the bulletin. We mentioned Kay, but I've been thinking about Kay recently, and, and I know that there's been a struggle. I know this, it, this may be appropriate, considering the fact that her daughter is struggling. So we do pray that you be with Kay on her time of need. We also pray for our bishop and our Slovak Zion Synod congregations, our community partners at Man and New Day, St. John. And Lord, whatever else is on our hearts and minds, we take this moment of silent prayer to lift these concerns to you. Lord, for our shut-ins, Pauline and Arlene and Peggy and Dorothy, Edna Gill, Anne, Mary Jo, Natalie, for those who serve our country, for Anne and Nick, those who are away from the places and people whom they love. Continue to bring them safe, give them safety, and bring them home soon. We ask and commit all of these things to you and to your care keeping in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. In whose name we pray. Amen. It's a great privilege today 
to stand in the presence of God and know that he gives to us himself in a very tangible way. So that is what we celebrate through the gift of this meal today. Remember how the night in which our Lord Christ was betrayed, he took bread and blessed it, gave it to his disciples, said, Take heed, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took a cup, and when he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, said, Take and drink of all of it, for this cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. We invite you to take this opportunity to prepare the meal which God has so graciously provided us. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus bless you and keep you his grace and peace now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are grateful again for the blessings of this meal that you provided for us in which we partake of that most precious of gifts, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior. Send us forth in peace this day that we might be refreshed and serve and uh, serve you faithfully. For he asks us all in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his favor and peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us sing together our closing hymn for today. This, of course, is uh, one of our favorite hymns. It has been traditionally one of our favorite hymns of the church. This was always sung at this congregation at the funerals of loved ones uh, by the choir of this church back in the day when we were very strongly uh, connected as a Slovak congregation or Slovak heritage. And so they have passed this tradition on to us. We give thanks for this wonderful song. We sing today, today God be with you till we meet again.